When I went to dinner, I found Mahjoub there, together with the Omda, Saeed the shopkeeper, and my father. We dined without Mustafa saying anything of interest. As was his wont, he listened more than he talked. When the conversation fell away and I found myself not greatly interested in it, I would look around me as though trying to find in the rooms and walls of the house the answer to the questions revolving in my head. It was, however, an ordinary house, neither better nor worse than those of the well-to-do in the village. Like the other houses, it was divided into two parts, one for the women and the other containing the diwan or reception room for the men. To the right of the diwan, I saw a rectangular room of red brick with green windows. Its roof was not the normal flat one, but triangular like the back of an ox. Mahjoub and I rose and left the rest. On the way, I asked Mahjoub about Mustafa. He told me nothing new, but said, Mustafa is a deep one. I spent two months happily enough in the village, and several times chance brought Mustafa and me together. On one occasion, I was invited to attend a meeting of the Agricultural Project Committee. It was Mahjoub, the president of the committee, and a childhood friend of mine who invited me. When I entered, I found that Mustafa was a member of the committee. They were looking into a matter concerning the distribution of water to the fields. It seemed that certain people, including some members of the committee, were opening up the water to their fields before the time allocated to them. The discussion became heated and some of them began shouting at each other. Suddenly I saw Mustafa jump to his feet at which the uproar died down and they listened to him with great respect. Mustafa said it was important that people should submit to the rules of the project, otherwise things would not get out of hand and chaos. Otherwise things would get out of hand and chaos would reign. Especially was it incumbent upon members of the committee to set a good example and that if they were to contravene the law, they would be punished like anyone else. When he stopped speaking, most members of the committee nodded their heads in approval. Those against whom his words had been directed kept silent. There was not the slightest doubt that the man was of a different clay, that by rights he should have been president of the committee, perhaps because he was not a local man they had not elected him. About a week later, something occurred that stunned me. Mahjoub had invited me to a drinking session, and while we were sitting about chatting along came Mustafa to talk to Mahjoub about something to do with the project. Mahjoub asked him to sit down, but he declined with apologies. When Mahjoub swore he would divorce if he did not, I once again saw the cloud of irritation wrinkle Mustafa's brows. However, he sat down and quickly regained his usual composure. Mahjoub passed him a glass at which he hesitated an instant before he took it and placed it beside him without drinking. Again, Mahjoub swore the same oath and Mustafa drank. I knew Mahjoub to be impetuous and it occurred to me to stop him annoying the man. It being quite evident, he did not at all wish to join the gathering. On second thoughts, though, I desisted. Mustafa drank the first glass with obvious distaste. He drank it quickly as though it were some unpleasant medicine, but when he came to the third glass, he began to slow up and to sip the drink with pleasure. The tension disappeared from the corners of his mouth, and his eyes became even more dreamy and listless. The strength you were aware of in his head, brow and nose became dissolved in the weakness that flowed with the drink over his eyes and mouth. Mustafa drank a fourth glass and a fifth. He no longer needed any encouragement, but Mahjoub was in any case continuing to swear he would divorce if the other did not drink up. Mustafa sank down into the chair, stretched out his legs, and grasped the glass in both hands. His eyes gave me the impression of wandering in faraway horizons. Then suddenly, I heard him reciting English poetry in a clear voice and with an impeccable accent. It was a poem which I later found in an anthology of poetry about the First World War and which goes as follows. Those women of Flanders await the lost, await the lost who never will leave the harbor. 
They await the lost whom the train never will bring. To the embrace of those women with dead faces, they await the lost who lie dead in the trenches, the barricade and the mud in the darkness of night. This is Charing Cross Station. The hours pass one. There was a faint light. There was a great pain. After that, he gave a deep sigh, still holding the glass between his hands, his eyes wandering off into the horizon within himself. I tell you that had, I tell you that had the ground suddenly split open and revealed an Efreet standing before me, his eyes shooting out flames, I would not have been more terrified. All of a sudden, there came to me the ghastly, nightmarish feeling that we, the men grouped together in that room were not a reality but merely some illusion leaping up i stood above the man and shouted shouted at him what's this you're saying what's this you're saying he gave me an icy look i don't know how to describe it though it was perhaps a mixture of contempt and annoyance pushing me violently aside he jumped to his feet and went out of the room with firm tread his head held high as though he were something mechanical. Mahjoub, busy laughing with the rest of the people in the gathering, did not notice what had occurred. On the next day, I went to him in his field. I found him busy digging up the ground round a lemon tree. He was wearing dirty khaki shorts and a rough cotton shirt that came down to his knees. There were smudges of mud on his face. He greeted me as usual with great politeness and said some of the branches of this tree produce lemons others oranges what an extraordinary thing i said deliberately speaking in english he looked at me in astonishment and said what when i repeated the phrase he laughed and said has your long stay in england made you forget arabic or do you reckon we've become anglicized but last night, I said to him, you recited poetry in English. His silence irritated me. It's clear you're someone other than the person you claim to be, I said to him. Wouldn't it be better if you told me the truth? He gave no sign of being affected by the threat implicit in my words, but continued to dig around the tree. I don't know what I said or what I did last night, he said when he had finished digging as he brushed the mud from his hands without looking at me. The words of a drunken man should not be taken too seriously. If I said anything, it was the ramblings of a sleep talker or the ravings of someone in a fever. It had no significance. I am this person before you, as known to everyone in the village. I am nothing other than that. I have nothing to hide. I went home, my head buzzing with thoughts, convinced that some story lay behind Mustafa, something he did not want to divulge. Had my ears betrayed me the night before, the English poetry he had recited was real enough. I had neither been drunk nor yet asleep. The image of him sitting in that chair, legs spread out and the glass held in both hands was clear and unequivocal. Should I speak to my father? Should I tell Mahjoub? Perhaps the man had killed someone somewhere and had fled from prison? Perhaps he. But what secrets are there in this village? Perhaps he had lost his memory? It is said that some people are stricken by amnesia following an accident. Finally, I decided to give him two or three days, and if he did not provide me with the truth, then I would tackle him about it. I did not have long to wait, for Mustafa came to see me the very same evening. On finding my father and brother with me, he said that he wanted to speak to me alone. I got up and we walked off together. Will you come to my house tomorrow evening? He said to me. I'd like to talk to you. When I returned, my father asked me, what's Mustafa want? I told him he wanted, to, he wanted me to explain a contract for the ownership of some land he had in Khartoum. Just before sunset, I went to him and found him alone, seated in front of a pot of tea. He offered me some, but I refused, for I was impatient to hear the story. He must surely have decided to tell the truth. He offered me a cigarette, which I accepted. I scrutinized his face as he slowly blew out the smoke. It appeared calm and strong. 
I dismissed the idea that he was a killer. The use of violence leaves a mark on the face that the eye cannot miss. As for his having lost his memory, this was a possibility. Finally, as Mustafa began to talk, I saw the mocking phantom around his eyes, more distinct than ever before, something as perceptible as a flash of lightning. I shall say things to you I've decided I've said to no one before. I found no reason for doing so until now. I've decided to do so lest your imagination run away with you, since you have studied poetry. He laughed so as to soften the edge of scorn that was evident in his voice. I was afraid you'd go and talk to the others, that you'd tell them I wasn't the man I claimed, which would, would cause a certain amount of embarrassment to them and to me. I thus have one request to make of you, that you promise me on your honor that you swear to me you won't divulge to a soul anything of what I am going to tell you tonight. He gave me a searching look and I said to him, that depends upon what you say to me. How can I promise when I know nothing about you? I swear to you, he said, that nothing of what I shall tell you will affect my presence in this village. I am a man in full possession of my faculties, peaceful and wanting only good for this village and its people. I will not conceal from you the fact that I hesitated, but the moment was charged with potentialities and my curiosity was boundless. The long and short of it was that I promised on oath at which Mustafa pushed a bundle of papers towards me, indicating that I should look at them. I opened the sheet of paper and found it to be his birth certificate. Mustafa Saeed, born in Khartoum, 16 August 1898. Father Saeed Uthman, deceased. Mother Fatima Abdusadik. After that, I opened his passport. The name, date, and place of birth were the same as in the birth certificate. The profession was given as student. The date of issue of the passport was 1916 in Cairo and it had been renewed in London in 1926. There was also another passport, a British one, issued in London in 1929. Turning over the pages, I found it was much, st it was much stamped. French, German, Chinese, and Danish, all this whetted my imagination in an extraordinary manner. I could not go on turning over the pages of the passport, neither was I particularly interested in looking at the other papers. My face must have been charged with expectancy when I looked at him. Mustafa went on blowing out smoke from his cigarette for a while. Then he said, 